We're now going to begin part three of the course on integration of functions of two or three variables. Let's first briefly review the single variable case. So we have a function f on an interval from a to b with values in the real numbers and we can draw the graph. So maybe it looks like this. So it goes from x equals a to x equals b. And the integral from a to b of f of x dx intuitively is the area under the curve. So that's only literally true if the function is positive, as I've drawn it in this example. If the function is negative, then for the parts where the graph goes below the x-axis, you'll have to subtract the areas of um, the regions bounded by those parts of the graph for the x-axis. Anyway, let's just look at the case where f is positive. And to rigorously define this, we partition the interval from a to b into n subintervals. So we'll define x0, x1, up to xn, where x0 and xn are equal to b, and the difference between any two of these is 1 over n of the total distance. So xi minus xi minus 1 equals b minus a over n. Let's call this number delta x. And we choose a sample point xi star between xi minus 1 and xi, and then we define the integral from a to b of f of x dx is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of xi star delta x. And the meaning of f xi star delta x is we have an interval between xi minus 1 and xi. And we have some point xi star in here. And we look at the value of f at that point, And what we're doing is we're taking a rectangle whose base is this interval from xi minus 1 to xi, and whose height is the value of f at that sample point. And then we're summing the areas over all these rectangles. So what we're doing is we're approximating the region under the graph of f by a bunch of, of uh, tall, skinny rectangles of width delta x. And we're adding up the areas of all those rectangles. And then we're taking the limit as the rectangles get thinner and thinner. And you can show so it's a theorem. You can learn about this in Math 104, that this is well-defined if f is continuous. Many other functions, too. Anyway, well-defined means that the limit converges, and also it does not depend on which sample points you choose. Okay, so that's single variable integration in a nutshell. Now, let's generalize this to functions of two variables. So now the setup is the following. We replace the interval with a rectangle. So R will be the interval AB Cartesian product with the interval CD. So I'm not sure if you've seen this notation before. So this is, what this means is it's the set of all points x, y in the plane such that x is from a to b and y is from c to d. So if we plot this on the x, y plane, 
here's the interval from A to B, here's the interval from C to D, and here's our rectangle. Okay, and now suppose we have a function f defined on this rectangle with values in the real numbers. So this ordinary r is the rectangle, and this blackboard bold r is the set of real numbers. And we can plot the graph of f. So it's above this rectangle r in the xy plane in some surface like this. This is the case where f is positive. If f were negative, then the surface would go below the xy plane. And now we can look at the region in between um, the base and the surface. We can look at the volume of this region. So we're, the in idea is we're going to define the double integral over the region R of f dA to be the volume under the graph. At, at least when, when f is positive. The definition will work for any f, positive or negative, but if f is negative, then you have to interpret this more carefully, subtracting the volumes of the parts where you go below the xy plane. Uh, and this dA, so the letter A here stands for area. So this is an element of area. All right, so to make a rigorous definition, we're going to proceed analogously to what we did in the single variable case. So we're going to divide the rectangle R into n squared sub rectangles. So here's a rectangle. It goes from x equals a to x equals b, and from y equals c to y equals d, and we divide the x direction into n equal parts, and we divide the y direction into n equal parts. So to write equations for this, we a equals x0, and less than x1, less than up to xn, equals b, and c equals y0, is less than y1, less than up to yn, equals d, where these are equally spaced, so xi minus xi minus 1 equals b minus a over n, as before, and we'll call this delta x, and yi minus yi minus 1 Likewise, is 1 over n of the distance or difference between c and d, so that's m d minus c over n, and we'll call that delta y. And now we have n squared rectangles, and we'll denote these by r i j. So this is the um, interval x i minus 1 comma x i cross Cartesian product the interval yj minus 1, yj. So for example, here on the lower left, this is r11. Here on the upper right, this is rnn. And down here, this is um, r21, r12, r22, etc. Okay, and the, the area of this rectangle Well, it's just the product of the lengths of the two sides, so that's delta x times delta y. And now we'll choose a sample point um, x i j star comma y i j star in the rectangle r i j. 
And now we can make the definition. So the double integral over R of FDA is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum as i and j go from 1 to n, so there are n squared terms here, of f of the point xij star comma yij star times delta x delta y. So what is the meaning of this product? Well, what we're doing is we're multiplying the area of the rectangle. So you remember this is the area of the rectangle times the value of f at some point in the rectangle. So that means that if we look at our graph here, so here's the rectangle, r, and here's the graph over it. If we have one of the little rectangles, rij, we're building a tall sort of skyscraper over this rectangle, whose height is the value of f at some point in the rectangle. So what we're doing is, sorry, this should be directly, these should be vertical lines. My picture didn't quite come out right. Anyway, what we're doing is we are approximating the region under the graph by a bunch of tall, skinny skyscrapers uh, right next to each other with no spaces in between them. We're adding up the volumes of all of these skyscrapers and then we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity, so the skyscrapers get thinner and thinner, and the errors, the fact that f is not equal to f at its sample point over the whole rectangle, those errors get smaller and smaller, and we converge. So the theorem again, you can prove this in a real analysis class. The theorem is that if f is continuous, it's also true for many not continuous functions f, but it's certainly true if f is continuous, then this double integral over r of f dA is well defined. So the limit exists and it does not depend on which sample points you choose. So let me just write the expression again, so we'll have it. So the double integral over r of f dA is the limit as n goes to infinity, sub from ij equals 1 to n, f of x ij star, y ij star, delta x delta y. Now just from this expression, we can read off some very basic properties. So first of all, what if we just integrate 1? Well, in that case, f is equal to 1 everywhere, so we're just summing up delta x times delta y. And remember, this is the area of the rectangle rij, so we're just summing up the areas of all of the subrectangles. And so this sum for every n is equal to just the total area of the rectangle. This is just the area of R. Okay. And some other basic properties are um, if you multiply the function by a constant, C, then you can pull the constant out of the integral. That's because the fact that if you have a sum, then you multiply f by a constant, then you can pull the constant out of the sum. And then you can also pull it out of the limit. Um, similarly, because of the sum rule for limits, if we integrate the sum of two functions, f and g, then we get the sum of their integrals. Um, and another useful property is that um,
if f is greater than or equal to g, by which I mean that f of xy is greater than or equal to g of xy, for every xy in the rectangle, then the double integral over r of f dA is greater than or equal to the double integral over r of g dA. Again, that sort of follows immediately from this formula. Okay, so that's the abstract definition of the integral. And now what you all want to know is how do you actually compute this? So we'll explain that in the next lecture segment.